Hello, friends. Hello. Welcome to this live news live stream. I <laughs> hear I'm reading the past. Welcome all. I'm seeing some lovely comments come in from people all over the place. So we've got, let's do a few of these before we kick off, shall we? Let's say uh, hello to Shannon from Portland, Oregon. Thank you for joining. Um, Dorothy's offering everyone a coffee. This is a few minutes ago, so she may already have a, her coffee on the go. Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, welcome indeed. We have got Victoria, British Columbia. Good afternoon, morning, evening. Don't know the time difference. <laughs> um, Devon probably as cold as it is here I'm assuming perhaps a tad colder um good morning Tasmania welcome it is indeed pink sunflowers chilly here we are we, snow is being threatened hello Marianne lovely to see you and uh, a special welcome to Noodle who I'm sure is of course a gentleman and a scholar you are welcome indeed Noodle somebody else in Devon as well hello Eric Hello, Silent family from Santa Cruz, California. We have less than a minute of the clock because we're here. And is this um, my new penchant for creating jingles <laughs> over on History After Dark? If uh, you haven't seen that, join it because I do. It's rude, but I do occasionally apparently make up all the jingles um, off the top of my head. So that's a good fun time. Where are we? Oh, we've had a big jump there. Hello, everybody. Um, we are, oh, I had a huge jump. Oh, it's all, everybody's coming in. Welcome. 55 of you are now. New York, we've got Minneapolis, Indiana. Um, right, let's start with, let's start with um, some disclaimers, which is now apparently a, a thing I do. <laughs> Philippa, Queen of the Jingle. Uh, that's <laughs> Queen, of, Queen of the Jingle and Queen of the Jiggle. All of it. Let's, let's, let's stay on track, shall we? Um, I'm going to do a disclaimer, which I do on a Wednesday night, but I feel the need to do it now. There may be mentioned today of ritual purposes. This is this is not a drinking game. I do not support that message. <laughs> it, it is both unsafe and unwise <laughs> for you to use this as a drinking game. Um, if you are joining on the live stream, I can see you coming in. I'm very pleased to have you all here. Thank you all for making it down. Thank you for taking the time, spending this time with me on whatever part of the Monday you are in. If you are watching this on the playback, thank you for joining us later we are always pleased to have you and i hope that you will enjoy seeing the conversation as it comes in and also enjoying what i've got to share with you we have as per some updates some new news and some events and exhibitions and the very last one i'm going to talk about is a very special one that philippa is in charge of so do stick around till the end to learn all about what's happening this month so make sure you're there I also have, of course, people to thank for sending me stories this month, this week, sorry. I'm very grateful for everybody who takes the time to spot history news and then send it my way. We do have some quite a bit of stuff to cover. I just want to flag up that I've seen quite a few new news stories that came into me for me late last night and also today. I was working on the stuff last night and today. I tend to do my prep for this on Sunday afternoons. So the the stuff that was sent to me late last night and today will be in next week's. So there we go. Let me begin by saying some thanks. I'd like to thank Maya, Joseph, Mary, Mrs. Pretty's Maid, Twins Things, Yvonne, Alberta, Joe, Jesse, Anne, Perpetual Mourner, Becky and Alea. And I'm very grateful, as I said before, that everybody takes the time, who does take the time to send me these news items. It really does mean a lot. And Pretty Pick has said, social glyphs for Philippa. Some, we've got some clapping hands. Of course, you know, ladies and gentlemen, friends, I love a good old social glyph in the comment section. It's always helpful to like, subscribe, push it up the algorithm so that YouTube knows that people enjoy engaging with this and then they are more likely to share it with more people and we can grow our community and have more people to have fun history chats with. Without further ado, let us hop in to the first of our updates. As always, these will be linked 
in an opera pin board that is in the description box and also the articles themselves will also be linked and numbered you will see at the bottom of each slide there is a number that relates to the news item that is linked in the description box first up we have the actual article that's talking about those deciphered Mary Queen of Scots letters we talked about it in last week's episode but here is the paper it is is linked and you will see that it's divided up into sections, section two, section three, etc. If you click on the section number, then it will take you directly to that bit of it. So of particular interest, I think, for us is section five, which does provide an inventory and some summaries of the deciphered letters. So if you're interested in the code breaking, check out Appendix A, obviously. Um, then Appendix B, they're examining a theory as to why the letters include numerous systematic in enciphering errors that makes the decipherment somewhat challenging. And then in Appendix C, they've got an up-to-date list of all the known letters from Mary Stewart to Castin Alal. So that is very worth checking out. And as I said, it's all linked in the description box. Another update that we have is on that ship that sank off uh, in the Baltic, uh, which had all of the spices in it. They have now got these amazing pictures in the article that's linked. It was incredible pictures of the spices they've brought out. So here, the, what, the picture that I've got up here is somebody holding up saffron that's been preserved. And one of the reasons why these natural substances have survived for 500 years is because of the particular qualities of the Baltic. It states that it's strange because it's low oxygen, low temperature, low salinity. That's a hard word for me to say for some reason. And so that means that organic things can be really well preserved in the Baltic where they wouldn't be so well preserved elsewhere. I think it's really interesting that this has been found. There's There are pictures where they've got the whole kind of just this rack of spices. These are incredibly high value items. And to have them all on this ship, this was a ship of incredible luxury. It was a ship that was owned by King Hans of Denmark uh, and it sunk in 1495. It was part of a political meeting that was supposed to be taking place in Sweden. So I'm assuming that this ship is going to be full of all of this stuff because it's really about showing off. It's about being flashy uh, and it all went to rack and ruin. But we have had it saved for us. So those are the updates I have. We're going to hop straight into the new news now. There was no uh, repatriations news that I spotted. If I've missed it or if it was sent to me, last night or today then it'll be in next week's but as it was i was checking i even went and looked for for more repatriations news but this week it seems we are no further on uh, although maybe it's because for the last few weeks we've just had consistently <laughs> repatriations news we have yes the only archaeological context where they found saffron i'm assuming that that means saffron in its kind of whole form because they they must have found traces um in food stuffs elsewhere so because we know they had saffron so that's very very interesting that i suppose that they're talking about whole saffron in this kind of context but maybe i'm wrong maybe this is the first time i would assume that it would have been on like bowls that had been discovered or whatever but it, it is saying the only archaeological context where we found saffron that's that is incredible uh thank you for this um this is the not just the tudors that is a podcast that's through history hit um who frequently sponsor videos on this channel so i very much enjoy that content and they have as you as you've pointed out an interview with one of the cryptologists who worked on the mary queen of scots letters so definitely worth checking out and some of you you may be aware that I did a giveaway for History Hit subscriptions. I gave away three History Hit subscriptions. I have now selected all of those winners. They have been informed and they are on their way to having their memberships or subscriptions rather winging their way to them. Hopefully it went well enough that History Hit will let me do something similar again. On with the new news. 
I'm, if I'm looking down, it's because it's on my um, iPad because I can't, can't see it on my screen because I still haven't been to the opticians and I probably should. We have got 500,000 year old signs of extinct human species found in a cave in Poland. They have discovered prehistoric stone tools in a cave in Poland 50 years ago. They have been recently, re I suppose, re-identified as some of the oldest ever discovered in the region. These tools are from between 450,000 and 550,000 years old. And this dating, we are being told, might allow scientists to learn more about the humans who made these objects, their migration and habitation in Central Europe across prehistory. It's thought that these tools were made by a extinct human species, Homo heidelbergensis. If I've mispronounced that, I apologise. I think that's how it's pronounced. The, they are thought to be the last common ancestors of Neanderthals and common and modern humans, namely us. So this means that this region would have been inhabited by humans at a time when the climate, which was harsh, would have required significant physical and cultural adjustment. An archaeologist working on it has pointed out this is an extremely as interesting aspect of analysis for us. We can examine the limits of possibilities of survival of Homo heidelbergensis and thus observe how they adapted to these adverse uh, conditions. The, the scholar involved said that this there were only two known sites in Poland with tools from around the same time. The, but these artifacts, we are told, are different because, carrying on, we were surprised that half a million years ago, people in this area stayed in caves. They were not the best place to camp, and that's because of moisture and low temperature, we're told. On the other hand, a cave is, of course, a natural shelter. It's a closed space that gives a sense of security. We found traces that indicate the people who stayed there use fire, which probably helped to tame these dark and moist places. They have also found a technique that was used to nap flint in the cave. And it's the simplest form that's used by ancient humans at the time these tools were created. So um, it's rarely used as a primary mode. It's only used on poor quality materials on where or when flint was in short supply. There's only one other site, which is in Italy, where it's using a technique that, as the primary one. The flint that has been found in this Polish cave is not poor quality, nor is it scarce being obtained locally. This was also the case for Inercia la Pineta, which is the Italian site. Um, so finding a second site with the same characteristics might help archaeologists work out the reasons why these particular ancient humans are using that specific technique. I'm wondering, does it potentially connect to habitat, environment, those 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 harsh conditions. Is there some reason why this particular form of flint napping works better and is thus found here? It says at the bottom that the team hopes to return to the cave in search of bones of Homo heidelbergensis. So where the tools were, hopefully that also means that there will indeed be some other finds, potentially archaeological remains. Hello, fellow Katrina, name twin, lovely to see you. Could I do a video on Catherine Brandon? I will put that on my list. If you do have suggestions for videos for me, please could you either pop them in an email or um, pop them over to me on either Twitter or Instagram. I do read my YouTube comments, but sometimes things get filtered, sometimes things get hidden, and I don't find the app particularly intuitive. So sometimes I'll spot something and then I can't find it to read the full comment. So people are like, I've got a suggestion for a video, dot, dot, dot. And then I go to try and find it and I can't seem to locate it. So the best places to reach me are either on my um, email or on Twitter or on Instagram, and they are all linked in my description box. If you can send stuff over to me, that would be very helpful. Full. Thank you very much. But yes, I will put make a mental note for Catherine Brandon or Catherine Willoughby, as she once was. Modelling of European Neanderthal migration hints at hidden archaeological hotspots in Iran. Now, being married as I am to somebody who was very involved in anthropology at university, I was kind of aware of this. I'd heard this suggestion be bubbling around. 
Uh, but this is an article that seems to be going beyond it being a suggestion or a best guess. So researchers modelling eastern Neanderthal migration from Europe have found the area south of the Caspian Sea in northern Iran to be the most likely route, suggesting that there could be significant yet to be discovered archaeological sites hidden in these less explored regions along the way. Of course, concerningly, is that a lot of these sites in recent decades have been high conflict zones. This paper, there's been a paper published that has followed computer modelling of Neanderthal dispersal across the northern and southern Caspian routes, and it's based upon the available archaeological and physiological data. The routes suggest that there are potential research opportunities in little-known regions of Iran and Central Asia where model, modelling predicts ideal Paleolithic habits. So, um, pretty pick is that's that's yes my my thoughts um but it's something that i i know it was being discussed well over a well over a decade ago uh and hello carol live in sydney australia don't get to catch on alive. live this is my favorite channel thank you and you're studying modern and social history and you find this most important. that's very kind of you and welcome and i have no idea what time it is for you in sydney australia but it's either very early or very late. So thank you for jumping in. Um, and I, I hope that you are awake for a for a good reason. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> we are. This is interesting. I don't pretend to know exactly how this is working, but I'm going to tell you what I've read and see if uh, if it makes some sense to you. They are New analysis of ancient human protein could unlock the secrets of evolution. This is protein lingering in the bones and teeth of ancient humans, I'm assuming in the marrowy bits, that could unravel the secrets of evolution of our species. There is a new technique. It's called proteo proteomics, which I assume is from protein and omics, <laughs> proteomics, which could allow them to identify proteins from which our predecessors' bodies were constructed and thus help to bring to life over two million years of history of our species. So they're going to use microscopic remnants to solve major evolutionary mysteries, such as the identity of our common ancestors, the common ancestors of Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. This is going to have massive uh, repercussions and ramifications because it potentially goes beyond what's achievable with DNA analysis, which, as we know, I mean, I'm sure there are I'm pretty sure there are some true crime buffs amongst us that pointed out that DNA studies have revolutionized lots of things, including criminal justice. But there is, of course, a downside to doing or attempting to do DNA work on very very old remains and that is it's incredibly difficult to get hold of dna from dry old remains what dna work has shown us is that modern humans do possess neanderthal genes and that has shown us through this dna work that there must have been inbreeding between humans and neanderthals i mean i am old enough just just old enough to remember a time when the um, presiding theory was that Neanderthals, Neanderthals didn't exist because Homo sapiens essentially hunted and killed them all, that there was some kind of war or just random act of violence. But actually, what's been discovered is that there must have been interbreeding. This is a UK project, project to assess the promise of this proteome, proteomics, um, and it's being done at the Francis Crick Institute in London and the Natural History Museum. This is going to be taking place over the next three years and they're going to be trying to get protein out of fossils, which is utterly incredible. Uh, and so they, the hope is that this is going to indicate that we can learn loads from looking at fossils in this way. So there have been there has been some success in analysing DNA from fossils. But as, it's, as I was saying, the, uh, the analysis of DNA, ancient DNA, has limitations. DNA, this is a quote, DNA is fragile 
oh, and it decays fairly, qu fairly quickly, especially in warm conditions. So it's mainly useful for studying fossils that are less than 100,000 years old and that have been found in moderately cool or cold places. This is particularly a problem for studying Homo sapiens because that species evolved in Africa, which is notoriously, as a continent, a pretty warm place. The DNA is rarely found in skulls and bones from excavations that are there because of these warm conditions. So they need to, they need to find another way to analyse the remains and see what they can figure out. As they, this article points out, we are made of proteins and the manufacture of those proteins is controlled by our DNA. And so if you unravel the protein structure, you can then apparently, the theory is, get insight into the makeup of the ancient individuals that then produce that protein. What's very important is that proteins survive longer in warm conditions. The latter advantage hopes uh, offers hope of gaining new insight into several, we are told, baffling newly discovered species. So this is Homo nadali, which is a 300,000-year-old homonym found in South Africa in 2013. The specimens, we are told, appear to be primitive, although other evidence suggests they also have buried their dead, which is interesting, those kind of, I'm going to say it, ritual purposes, but ritual in what is a 300,000 year old form of hominin is really interesting. There's also where they want to find the origins of Homo florian, floriciensis, I think that's how you pronounce it, which is a small archaic species of human, <laughs> beautifully nicknamed the Hob Hobbit folk, which has been found in Indonesia and also puzzled scientists. Conditions on both sites have meant there's been no DNA found. It's warm, they're warm places, so the fossils are, are DNA free. But theoretically, the proteins are going to, fingers crossed, be able to reverse engineer perhaps the way that DNA is working. That's what I'm understanding from this article, that essentially the things that make up your body, you, the genetics essentially, is what signifies and allows the proteins to form. And so if you can figure out how the proteins will form, you can reverse engineer the genetics? Well, I will certainly be keeping an eye out um, to see how successful this is, how well it works. I think we've got an exciting three years ahead when it comes to looking at prehistoric human forms and human remains. I'm not going to lie to you. When I saw this picture, um, on when, when I first opened this article and this picture popped up, I was um, haunted, chilled, if you will, because I don't like that tunnel. And I know I should be a grown up, but I, I just every time I look at it, I feel like there's gonna be something, a face is gonna pop up at the back. Um, <laughs> maybe I'm the only one, but it makes me feel a bit sweaty. So we're gonna be quick, um, and I'm gonna try not to look at it very closely. This is a nine meter long or thirty foot long corridor that's been discovered close to the main entrance of the Great Pyramid of Giza. The pyramid itself is 4,500 years old. The tunnel is looking at me. I swear it's winking at me. Um, and the hope is it's going to lead to further findings. Be careful. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> God, that is... A, that is um, I think maybe that's what it is. The blurriness is threatening. It, you can, it's like it's one of those things. What is it that your mind tries to create patterns? And my 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 mind is creating creating faces. <laughs> um, I think that's a, yeah. Thanks, bye. Yeah, big note pole. It's a massive note pole to me too. But it may also have archaeological value. I'm sure it does. In fact. This uh, the discovery within this pyramid is was made um, under the Scan Pyramids project, which has been working since 2015 using non-invasive technology, including infrared thermography, 3D simulations, and cosmic ray imaging. What is cosmic ray imaging? I said to myself when I read this, but. I will look it up another time. Cosmic ray imaging sounds delightful and like it might be very relaxing. This they use it to peer inside the structure. An article was published in the journal Nature on Thursday that said 
that this discovery could contribute to knowledge about how the pyramid was constructed and the purpose of a gabled limestone structure that sits in front of the corridor. It's thought that this corridor was likely created to distribute the pyramid's weight around either the main entrance, which is now used by tourists almost seven metres away, or around an as yet undiscovered chamber or space. The plan is to continue scanning, so we will see what they can find out to figure out what they're going to see behind, beneath this corridor, or just at the end of the corridor. So I suppose we will wait and see what they'll find at the end of that utterly unspeakable, <laughs> terrifying um, abyss of a hole. I, I, I do, I do love it. Am I having? Am I having a cell memory? Do you know what? Right. You're kidding. But I did uh, some live interpretation. I'm going to go off on a tangent. Welcome. Oh, I did some live interpretation in my youth and still hopefully. But one of them, I was in a old prison cell that was in fact used as a prison. And I was in there alone and I had the door closed and I was waiting for the public to be brought in by my colleagues. And I was sure that there was, in fact, somebody had snuck into the room with me. So, and I was under like a hessian cloth. So I'm there going, this, someone's come in the room. I should probably deal with that. I should also point out that I was chained to the wall. So that made me feel very vulnerable. But friends, there was nobody in the room. And every time I was in there, I was absolutely sure there was, because there, there was somebody in that space. But I don't think they'd been alive for a while. Um, Not like illegally, I was playing a prisoner. I was playing somebody who was imprisoned. In fact, a lady pirate who I kind of loved, despite her being a big old murderer. I have a, she has a, a warm little place in my heart, that Tudor lady. Um, but yes, she, she brought me to a room where there was something incredibly up, upsetting and creepy. So for that, I don't thank her. But for other things, I do. <laughs> that was my tangent. Let's get back on the track. <laughs> we have got evidence of steel tools being used in Europe during the late Bronze Age, which I think perhaps um, might need require a name change. They researchers discovered that steel tools were being used on the Iberian Peninsula during the late Bronze Age, just under 3,000 years ago, 2,900 years ago to be specific. This is an international study that has conducted geochemical analysis on stone pillar stele that were found in the Iberian Peninsula that re revealed that the engravings on the rock itself were created using tempered steel. They then done a metallographic analysis of an iron chisel from the same period, which had the necessary carbon content to be classed as steel. Until recently, it was assumed the inhabitants of this region lacked the skill and understanding to produce steel in the early early Iron Age, and certainly not in the late Bronze Age, which only became widespread through contact and conquest with the Romans. The Iberian Bronze Age started around 1800 BCE and concluded with the Iberian Iron Age sometime during the 9th century BCE. Dr. Ralph Arake Gonzalez, who is an archaeologist from the University of Freiburg, said, quote, the chisel from Roja de Vijo and the context where it was found shows that iron, metal metal bloop, iron metallurgy, so that was a hard word to say, which includes the production and tempering of steel, was probably indigenous developments of decentralised small communities in Iberia and not due to the influence of later the colonization processes. That's really interesting. It is not a skill and technique that's been given to them by an invading Roman force. They are figuring it out by themselves. Their, their closer inspection of the chisel from Roja de Vijo reveals that it consists of heterogeneous, let yet astonishingly carbon rich steel. To confirm their findings, the researchers carried out an experiment involving a professional stonemason, a blacksmith, and a bronze caster, which does sound like the start of a fun joke, actually. I'll try and write that later. The attempts to work examples of silicate quartz sandstone using chisels of different materials. Once again, experimental archaeology for the win. 
the stonemason was unable to work the stone with either the stone or bronze chisels, or even using an iron chisel with an untempered point. The people of the late Bronze Age in Iberia were capable of tempering steel. Otherwise, they would not have been able to work the pillars, is the conclusion that is um, put on um, these finds, that they, it must have been tempered steel, because otherwise it wouldn't have worked. And thus, we might have a new development and understanding in what's happening in the late Bronze Age, or perhaps the new Steel Age. Here we go. I always find it so interesting how history has to change as science progresses. Well, absolutely, because the thing is, there is no historical truth. Everything is just temporarily valid. And our understanding of various things in history, to my mind, the mark of a historian that I trust is someone who goes, well, this is how I understand it. This is my interpretation based upon the available evidence. So I have opinions about various things. For example, I believe that a big one that, that's, that's a cause of controversy. I believe that the author of the plays of William Shakespeare is, in fact, the man from Stratford, the son of a glover, the boy called William Shakespeare, who goes and moves to London, who was married to Anne Hathaway. I believe that is the author of the plays, based upon the available evidence. So if that were to change, I would be very willing to reassess my understanding and switch it about. It's also worth pointing out that history is and always will be political because we the curriculum is set down by the providing or provising state that's in charge. And they aren't going to allow history to be taught in ways that don't align with national identity. And history is something that's so bound up in national identity and that can be so rarefied uh, that things will always change. And that's why I think history is beautiful because it's always new stuff to be taught, understood, questioned, constantly questioned. Um, for example, history, Shakespeare written by aliens, as for the pyramids. Yes, I mean, why not? Why not? <laughs> um, historical truth is just temporarily valid. Yes, yes. Vividly remember being taught that Christopher Columbus discovered America. Of course, of course he did. Of discovered America. History has absolutely changed that interpretation. I, I I think um pretty pick what what we are noticing is that it's just it for us for students of history in the erasure of certain things and the and the very enhanced precisation we're just seeing it more clearly it's kind of it's always happened um but it's it's almost impossible to ignore currently is the th is the thing. <laughs> We have got this. Look at these beautiful beads, aren't they? Aren't they lovely? Um, just well, just too the funny. <laughs> the Discovery of America just got back. Those ten million people are already there. Must have been so. I mean, that's what that's what I think. They didn't know where they, were. <laughs> they didn't know what they'd done. <laughs> just did a, did a big did a whoopsie. <laughs> um, look at these. Aren't they beautiful? These beads. This is a team of Polish and Armenian archaeologists who have discovered a tomb at the Metzmore archaeological site containing ornate gold necklaces dating from the Bronze Age. This is in uh, the Armavir province of Armenia, where the oldest trace of human settlement dates from the 4th millennium BCE during the Copper Age. People are, people are ragging on these beasts. <laughs> ragging on them it looks like Chex mix which i think is probably i could you know what now i think i know what that is and now you said it the circles with the cross in them i can't unsee that now <laughs> they look like uncooked noodles well <laughs> i mean on the one hand you're not wrong but on the other hand i still think they're really cool <laughs> um Marianne, you've you got some love for the beads. I also would like reproductions of the beads, although now it would feel like um, if I made them into a necklace, they would look like something my son might have made me at daycare, which, of course, I would cherish, love and adore. <laughs> I need to eat before these talks. 
pass the, pass the, any kid any kindergarten <laughs> forbidden noodles <laughs> right okay come on let's <laughs> right um <laughs> Oh dear! So this from the fourth millennium BCE during the Copper Age, the in the Bronze Age, early Iron Ages, this site became an important religious and economic center. Uh, Develop into a city with many temples and sanctuaries, fortified by a citadel and cyclopean walls. There was an advanced economy based upon metallurgical production. Archaeologists also have found over a hundred beads made from gold and carnelian. I'm not 100% sure what carnelian is. I'm wondering if that is the beads that look like beneath the gold ones. Is that carnelian? It looks like it could be some form of stone, um, as well as golden pendants. And they've also found a dozen complete ceramic vessels, uh, a unique faience flask that was imported from the Syrian Mesopotamian borderland. So I don't know you guys. Carnelian is a red stone. Just is it red like those ones beneath? The are they are they the kind of red that it would be that reddish gold color? So is that gold and carnelian stones? I guess that that's is that what's there then? That looks like that sounds like that would be what that's what that is. If I'm wrong, we're, we're saying yes. It can be. It could be. Yes, rust, red, orange. I'm correct. Perfect. I like it when I'm correct. Thank you very much, very much. Hive mind. I'm loving this. This is why lives are so fun, because I can double check things. Those are carnelian. Lovely. I've never come across carnelian before. I assumed it was some kind of stone, but I've never I never knew what it looked like. They can be semi-clear to more opaque. I wonder if they also if they change perhaps with age and work. Lovely. So um the tomb was found in a necropolis where over 100 graves have already been examined, with only with several having been looted during antiquity. Uh, Metzamor is a protected archaeological site with the status of an archaeological reserve. Excavations in the area have been carried out since 1965, uncovering other examples of gold necklaces and gilded belt fittings with depictions of hunting lionesses. What a rich site. What I take from this is that that this site is not done. So there's more to come. Now, our next story, um, I'm going to show you the first piece of news that came out and then what happened two days later. And this is the importance, friends, sometimes of not jumping the gun and waiting for the peer review, despite the fact that peer review can on occasion take two years because sometimes it's if you don't, you are left with egg on your face. This sounds like a fantastic find, doesn't it? A hiker who has discovered one of the earliest known references to the famous Persian king Darius uh, has been found. Uh, and it's found on an ancient receipt. It They said it dated to 498 BCE. This was revealed on March the 1st, 2023. Well, friends... If you notice that, that's the 3rd of March, 2023. The ancient Darius in, inscription shard isn't authentic. They have The officials have backtracked on this find, saying that the fragment was in fact created by an expert who was showing inscription techniques to students and then was accidentally left at the dig site. Teachers, police your teaching material. I I just I I feel really bad for whoever was given the task of announcing this. Um, it's it's not something I have not seen this happen regularly, particularly not from an institution like the Israeli Antiquities Authority. It's it's not something that you. I think excitement got the better of people. I think also. In a in a twenty four hour news cycle, when we're when we're constantly looking for more things to say afloat, and there is a kind of competitive find hunting and and kind of value there. And let's also remember that things like 
this, fines like this drive tourism. I get it. I get why you'd announce it. But, oh, boy, having to walk it back after two days and the fact that it's not even – I mean, I thought when I opened it that it was going to be – someone had attempted to create something fraudulent to trick people. The fact that it was an expert teaching students, oh, I just – I can't help but feel – like it makes me feel a bit kind of itchy all over. <laughs> like, you know, that kind of secondhand embarrassment where you just, you're just so thankful it wasn't you. I mean, what's the German word for that? Whatever the opposite of Schadenfreude is. Um, oh, no, foiled by educational materials. <laughs> uh and yeah, I mean, stuff like this does happen. But usually when something's been tricked, when somebody's been tricked by something, it happens because there was an intention to deceive. Um, or somebody has gone into a, into a location and they found four or five different things, like, for example, the, the Roman dildo that we found. Well, it's in with a bunch of craft supplies, so for years and years it's something that's been used for crochet or darning or weaving or whatever. Uh, so I understand that kind of – I can understand how correlation and causation can be confused, but something like this, for it not to be – somebody intentionally tried to deceive and for it to have gone this quickly and then we be walked back. I've, I can't remember something like this happening before. I just feel very bad for the people involved. We, um, this, there are, um, <laughs> there are, we're back to spin this again. Yes, we are back. To, we're back. To, we're, we're, and there's going to be another, and, and hold on to your boots, John, because there's a, there's going to be another phallus, a different phallus, but the the phallus is happening. The opposite of Schadenfreude is Fraudenfreude. What does Fra what does Fraudenfreude mean? I like that word a lot, Fraudenfreude. Um, this article does have pictures attached because even though it's not full human remains, and but despite that, as my policy is, I do not show human remains on this channel there are um it, i'm not showing the picture if you want to see it you can go and click on the link it's there it's available a fragment of a comb is made from a human skull this was discovered by mola that's the team from the museum of london archaeology this has been found at bar hill which is near cambridge england <laughs> Google assistant listening to me going, sounds stressful. Is there anything I can do to help? <laughs> uh, Siri, book a therapist appointment. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. Gosh, when the computer's ratting on you, that's um, that's a time. Oh, we've got we've got a description of it. Freudenfreude is the antithesis of Schadenfreude taking pleasure from someone's misfortune so it describes someone being happy someone else's joy and success oh so yes yeah, so schadenfreude what would be the thing where you feel an empathy for someone else's embarrassment and you take no pleasure in it so maybe not the antithesis of schadenfreude a connected kinder cousin <laughs> and also an eye appointment all right you're not wrong <laughs> oh here we go what's this I frem de shaman. We had it again. Frem de shaman. Secondhand embarrassment or secondhand cringe. Oh, lovely. There's always a great German word for these things. Fabulous. Well, there we go. A history with a side of languages. That's why. That's why I, we're, we're doing this, isn't it? Love it. So let's let's get back to our skull comb. It was found once again. In so many things at the moment being found because they're they're building roads or buildings. This is in preparation for the A14 Cambridge to Huntingdon scheme. The comb is thought to date from the Iron Age, uh, and it's thought to date between 750 BCE and 43 CE. So 43 CE, that is Roman invasion time. It's a semicircular in shape with teeth carved into one edge. Uh, when they found it, though, it's thought that it was potentially worn as an amulet. So I'm wondering if it was a comb in the hair. So a skull comb on top of the skull. How interesting. 
the they have discovered that across Europe, the human head is really important to Iron Age people. They are collected and displayed at entrances to settlements in Britain. This act could have take place, taken place during times of conflict as some form of head-hunting trophy. In the article, they've got a reconstructed drawing of the comb that they think it would have originally been rectangular with rounded edges and a circular hole for fastening to clothing. So not um, used as an actual comb or maybe used as a comb. This is only one of three Iron Age combs to be made from human skulls that have ever been found in the UK. The first was found at excavations at Erith, which is nine miles north of Bar Hill in the 70s. The second has carved lines rather than teeth, and it was found at Harston Mill, 10 miles south of Bar Hill in, in the early 2000s, which is suggesting that this wearing of decorative combs that don't seem to be used in the hair are something that's an Iron Age tradition from this part of Britain, which is around modern day Cambridgeshire. Michael Marshall, who is from Mola, said, quote, these carved teeth and lines would have highlighted the Bar Hill Combs origin, especially for local Iron Age communities who were familiar with skeletal remains. Its symbolism and significance would have been obvious to anyone who encountered it. Well, Debbie, if three makes a serial killer, <laughs> then perhaps three does make a does make a tradition. Let's two's two a coincidence, three's a tradition. I, I have to. We'll have to. I will res, reserve my opinion until we hear from the team at Mola. Who wouldn't want to brush their hair with a comb made for their nana's head? I mean, me. <laughs> I volunteer is not me. <laughs> like a Hello Kitty comb, pretty but useless. I think it probably is more like if a Hello Kitty comb went fully goth and like started bleeding from the eyes. I think there's there's a there's definitely a a threat aspect in this. Like there was a war, we won, and now we decorate our clothing with bits of your skull. Is some um, metal, frankly. <laughs> the Oscars <laughs> just got really different. <laughs> oh Lord! Oh dear! Oh dear! Oh dear! I, I am, I'm a bad grown up today. Oh wow! Okay. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> Hello, emo kitty. <laughs> And uh, I hello a uh, hello kitty going completely goth. That would be ace. That would be ace. It is. It's literally hardcore, hardcore death metal. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, uh. It's very difficult to it's very difficult to get through these without laughing. Trust and believe. It's also especially hard for me to get through these without swearing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> spring collection. I mean, there wasn't there that thing where they wore they wore live hissing hossing, hissing cockroaches. So I mean, do you know do you know what's creepy? Is that there's probably someone who's got one of those old anatomical collections who is doing stuff like this. I bet there's someone on TikTok doing it. I bet it's happening already. That's that's the thing. We're laughing about it, but I bet it's happening. Uh, oh wow. We've had a big jump in. Well, hello, T Lady Whimsy. I would love tell me, do you know what? That's for another, that's a conversation for another day, but welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Right. <laughs> okay. Okay. We're hopping on. We're hopping on because now we do you know what? It's not gonna get better, the giggles, because we're hopping from Skullcomb to this. Right. 
Metal Tetris thought they'd found a split pin. For those who don't know, split pins are used for securing things in to the ground. It's used to fa- no, sorry, a tool to fasten bolts. They thought they'd found a split pin. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. What they'd actually found was a two thousand year old Celtic statue with. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> so sorry. Oh, oh, come on, grow up. Right. It's the fact that they <laughs> just beat the t- out of the ground and be like, a split bit, anyone? And they going, oh, hello. I'll have your eye out. <laughs> so, a statue of a small man with a really big bronze penis in his right hand was found in English field last year. <laughs> it's being auctioned. And it could sell, they expect it to sell for hundreds um, in coming weeks. It's being sold by Noonan's. Okay, come on. Okay, I'm going to keep myself together. Um, Paul Shepard, who's been a detectorist for 25 years, and his wife Julie rushed a detector rally in Hackenby, Lincolnshire, where they were alerted to something buried in the stubble field. <clears throat> After doing Digging 10 inches into the ground, the couple uncovered what they thought was a split pin. <laughs> after, after taking a harder look at the figure, the couple realised that it's actually a two-inch tall Celtic figure, sta- Celtic age statue with an oversized moving member. So, <laughs> so what's even better about it? It's, it's articulated. You could, you could wiggle it at people. Um, it's a pendant, the penis pendant, is being put up for auction in Mayfair in London. Um, and do you know what? It's going for the low, low price of um, 800 to 1200 pounds. It might go as, it might go up to as much as they've got here. Um, $1,440. I'm assuming they mean, they mean pounds. Do you know what? <laughs> That's a bug. <laughs> I'm sorry. I am nearly 40. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, right. So Nigel Mill, who works for the auction house Noonan's, said, quote, that there was nothing quite like it. You can say that again, Nigel. Um, it states it dates back to the first century AD and it might have been a fertility idol based on the Roman god Mercury. I am so I'm never. <laughs> not really like this. OK, um, the male figure with its hinged oversized phallus would have had symbolic powers of good luck and warding off evil, evil spirits. <laughs> and it may have served as a locking mechanism to buckle, uh, to a buckle to hold a belt and a scabbard for a sword. <sighs> so they initially thought the art was Romans, as, as we know that Romans like to um, keep pieces. <laughs> 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 and they have a bit of an obsession with phallic symbols, but this one was uh, designed by the Celts, who've added a hinged element for very artistic purposes, which may maybe makes the feelings even more obvious. Um, this is being auctioned by the couple that found it, uh, and they say that, they, that they're planning to blow their their <laughs> blow their. <laughs> 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 on um, a, a vacation for his wife and his mother. I mean, it's that ill-gotten games. I don't know. I love that. There are many examples of ancient phallic iconography and statues that represent fertility, good luck, fables lost to history, ancient feuds. Scientists wrote a paper, we, talk, we talked about this, on a 2,000 wooden objects that could perhaps be a Roman dildo. This supposed dildo measured six inches, but was probably longer and bigger in its heyday, as, quote, archaeological wood is prone to shrinkage and warping. Meanwhile, <laughs> our two-inch bronze guy... <laughs> no, they know what they're doing with that last sentence. Um, the Hakenbury <laughs> Celtic Trinity figure, they say, remains firm. They knew what they were doing with that. They knew... <laughs> John, thank you so much for the phallus fund. Oh, Lord. (laughs) Do you know what? I might actually follow the auction (laughs) and see what it goes for. And um, I'll definitely update you. Maybe, maybe I'll 
be back in a, in a couple of weeks with with this object in my sweaty little hand. <laughs> I think it's brilliant. What an incredible thing! Um, and it does make it does make me laugh. Something as obviously, um, and maybe that's the point. Um, maybe that is the point that. It's not childish to laugh. That the point is that you see it and go, "That is really funny." Like somebody who has uh, a funny logo on a T-shirt today. I mean, my husband has a great T-shirt which looks like a children's book cover that says "Let's Summon Demons," and I just think it makes me—it absolutely kills me every time I see it. John, I'm incredibly grateful. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and we have <clears throat> we have some um, other comments in as well. Um, blow what now <laughs> my thoughts exactly my thoughts exactly um <laughs> blow their money yep um it's, it does have a loop it is a pendant however i think that loop could potentially they're saying be um hooked into the back of the belt and i i wonder if they're saying that the, the winky could be the thing that holds the belt in place i mean can you imagine that looking at you um, the wood, Marcus, is the wooden Roman penis that we talked about last week that shrink that had some shrinkage. It could have been bigger, the dildo, but this, as it's not wood, has had no such shrinkage. Shrinkage. Um, Bobby, I thought of you when I saw this. Thank you. <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> I can see why, though. Um, I would love to conduct a tour. It would be an absolutely, um, I would try and be a, a, a professional about it, but I would definitely want to, um, <laughs> definitely want to do some of the less salubrious things. Um, I will be keeping track of, of all of the updates on this. Um, and I've just had to see the suggestion for a new segment, Willie of the Week. <laughs> so it'll be like um, updates, repatriations, new news, Willie of the Week. <laughs> I might do it though. This sounds so funny. Oh, oh wowie, wowie, wowie. <sighs> Willie of the week. Right, okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna put I'm gonna put um <laughs> Willie of the Week in my brain, in my brain box. Um <clears throat> a gutter tour well if philip is still in the chat um she actually she uh has her own historical tour company so <laughs> if there's a market for a tour of filth <laughs> tour of london's filth i'm sure that we can we can figure something out <laughs> you wouldn't well you wouldn't get if you came with me love you wouldn't get a professional tour guide <laughs> You wouldn't, at best, you'd find some nice pubs and you'd not end up in a ditch. <laughs> That's the best I can promise. <laughs> um, hello, Philippa. Well, then, you see, this is what the people want. They want me to take them around London <laughs> to talk <you> about <laughs> penises. <laughs> I, I mean, it, it probably probably won't be good for your brand. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but this is what the people want. <laughs> I love you. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, right, <clears throat> right. Okay, let's get this. Let's get this train back on the tracks. Just enough of my nonsense. <laughs> okay, we have archaeologists working on Easter Island have discovered uh, a previously unknown Mawa statue that was buried in a dried out lake bed. This one is um, causing, obviously, lots of excitement. It's, but they're saying that this one is smaller than most of the other ones that have been found on the island, and it was in this dry lake bed. The area is not usually accessible to humans, but because of climate change, it has dried out, allowing archaeologists to get a look at it. Unsurprisingly, it's being referred to as a very important discovery. It's here in the lake, and nobody knows it exists. Even the ancestors, our grandparents, didn't know about this one. So what it's pointing out is they think that they know all of these um, these heads. They think they know all of them, but 
clearly there may well be more to be found. So archaeologists are now on a mission to see what else they can unearth at this site, and they're currently on the lookout of evidence of Maui as well as tools that might have been used to make them. Why is it smaller? That's interesting. They've been hidden by tall reeds that grow in the lake bed and prospecting with something that can detect what's underground under the under the ground surface might tell us that there are in fact more Maui in the lake bed settlements. The thought being that when there's one in the lake, there's probably more. <clears throat> there are approximately 1,000 Maui on Easter Island. They are important because they represent the history <clears throat> of the people. <clears throat> pardon me, sorry, the island's deified ancestors. And of course, they are iconic worldwide and they represent the archaeological history of this island. You see those and you immediately think Easter Island. It's just, it's just, they're synonymous with each other. Many of the monuments are still being excavated. So finding out, I suppose, what's below shoulder, shoulder level. Um, and they are vulnerable to damage, even attack. For example, last fall, if you're British, autumn, an arsonist set fire to the island, leaving some statues charred and cracked. And then in 2020, another one was knocked over by a runaway pickup truck. Like, maybe let's not let's not allow vehicles nearby, hey? Um, as such, there is an ongoing debate. This maybe this could have gone into repatriations. An ongoing debate over whether one sculpture, which was taken without permission by the UK's Royal Navy in 1868, there is of course a theme there, um, and is currently held in the, you guessed it, British Museum, should be repatriated or remain in safekeeping for now. I mean, there could be an attack. That you can't, an arsonist and a runaway truck, like, that is a human crime and also an accident. That stuff could just as easily happen. The British Museum is not immune to that happening. That, yeah, I mean, that's the argument that we hear a lot isn't it it is a repatriation story it's sort of it's sort of it's it's, it's a sneaky repatriation story um and then it it hops it hops back back and forth um if the phallus frenzy continues you might have to move this broadcast to after dark yes or i'll have to try and find ways to talk in euphemisms because i'm never sure what youtube lets me get away with um i'm not sure if the intention of the arson was to destroy the pieces or was just arson for arson's sake i i don't know if i don't know if it's clear what the intention actually was um the arsonist set fire to the island i i know that lots of kind of bushfires uh i believe in the states perhaps also in australia have been started or or, or deemed to have been started as a result of arson it we need a forensic psychologist to understand why people do arson um but my understanding is it's usual usually they think or maybe i'm delayed in my dsm um that it's usually connected to sexual frustration so may have nothing to do with the sculptures and may have more to do with other issues <clears throat> we're hopping to the medieval period and the thought that perhaps uh edward the black prince so this may perhaps did not die from chronic dysentery after all. This is Edward of Woods, Woodstock, known as Edward the Black Prince, who was a famous, famed warrior from the period. But he died from some disease relatively young at 45. It's often been thought that he died of something called chronic dysentery. But James Robert Anderson, who is a military historian, believes that it's more likely he was brought down either by malaria or by inflammatory bowel disease. He has worked with some co-authors to write a paper that was published in the BMJ Military Health Journal. They point out there are several diverse infections or inflammatory conditions that may have led to his demise. These might include malaria, brucellosis, inflammatory bowel disease, or long-term complications of acute dysentery. However, chronic dysentery is probably unlikely. His illness emerged following his victory at the Battle of Najera in the, in the summer of 1367. 
Apparently about 80% of his army may have died from dysentery or other diseases. Uh, and there were significant hardships and hunger during the campaign. In 1370, the Black Prince is described as having been lying sick in his bed and he had to be carried in a litter direct to the siege of Limoges. I don't know why you're going besieging if you are literally peeing out of your bum hole but okay um he recovered sufficiently to board a ship for his military campaign in 1372 but doesn't seem to have been active during 1374 to 75 suggesting that his symptoms may have reappeared this they're going to get to something something like this maybe he had crohn's disease they're going to approach this um so we'll continue on something called amoebic dysentery often leads to chronic complications like colitis toxic megacolon and chronic ulcers which they say would have been consistent with the recurrent illnesses and drawn out decline the authors of this paper uh, argue that it was unlikely he would have been allowed to board a ship in 1372 with chronic dysentery i mean i don't know about <laughs> you but prince or not if somebody has chronic dysentery and they are trying to get on a tiny bloody boat with me, I'd be like, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> um, they suggest, though, that a fistula, nephritis or cirrhosis or a combination of, of those might have been an alternate diagnosis. Uh, complications from acute dysentery might also fit the bill. They also suggest that dropsy... Uh, known today as edema, related to liver or heart or kidney failure, might be going on too. But the authors of this paper point out that it's unlikely that he would have been able to survive for several years without uh, without treatment. However, if he was malnourished, had some dysentery, a spot of dysentery, then also was so was dehydrated, he might have got kidney stones. They also point out that inflammatory bowel disease also fits the pattern of the illness, particularly if it led to a fistula. He might have suffered from something called brucellosis, a bacterial infection that's usually contracted by consuming unpasteurized dairy or raw meat. We're talking, I'm seeing some conversation about um, dairy and raw meat in the chat. It results in fatigue, fever, inflammation of the heart and joints. Potentially malaria also fits. Um, because of the fluctuating nature, fever, headache, myalgia, gastrointestinal duress, chronic in gastrointestinal distress, chronic anemia, fatigue, and vulnerability to infection, which can also lead to multiple organ failure. Regardless of the cause of the death, as they point out, it changes the course of history and really triggers a century of instability. After his death, he is he leaves as his heir, his son Richard II, who comes to the throne as a boy of 10. He is deposed by his cousin Henry Bolingbroke, um, who is the brother of the Black Prince's, who is the son of the brother of the Black Prince, John of Gaunt. And then we get on to uh, Henry VI, Henry IV, and then there's, sorry, we're going to Henry IV, and then the Wars of the Roses and the toing and fro in there with those kinds of complications and failures. They conclude, even in modern conflicts and war zones, disease causes enormous morbidity and, co and loss of life. And that's something that has remained consistent for centuries. Efforts to protect and treat deployed forces are as important now as in the 1370s. I see a lot of people talking about IBS and um, Crohn's disease. I, I think there's there's clearly something going on, and I am um, and without medical intervention, it would have been desperately uncomfortable uh, and a unpleasant time all around. I would imagine. We're sticking with medieval news and we're talking about a study that has found that some 90% of medieval chivalric and heroic manuscripts might have been lost. And as you can see in the linked article, there is a video. And what you see there is what looks like a paper bishop's mitre. And there is a reason for that that we'll get to. It points out that there that those who study human culture must grapple with what amounts to an incomplete data 
to set, and that is never more true than when it comes to medieval manuscript. They point out there is a predicament known as survivorship bias, and it can lead to underestimations of how diverse society might have been in terms of the cultural materials produced. Teasing out how much of a cultural domain might have been lost is a considerable challenge. We've got a new paper published in the journal Science. A international team of researchers has adapted an ecological unseen species model to estimate how many medieval stories in the chivalric romance or heroic tradition survived and how much has been lost. They presented their findings at a virtual meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, or the AAA. They looked at medieval works in Dutch, English, French, German, Icelandic and Irish and concluded that only about 9% of medieval manuscripts survived. But these losses were, however, significantly lower in Icelandic and Irish literature, suggesting that island ecosystems might help to preserve culture. In fact, the team's results were very similar to the estimates made by scholars using other data, such as references to lost work that appear in surviving manuscripts. So, moving on, what? let's have a look at this bishop's mitre that appears to be made of paper. Well, friends, it is. It's a fragment of a medieval manuscript that has been used to stiffen a bishop's mitre. <laughs> Where did all these lost copies of these works go? They point out that some are going to be lost in library fires. Then also we have the dissolution of the monasteries that's going to scatter and potentially destroy the libraries, certainly break them apart. But of course, they point out that chivalric and historic stories may be unlikely to fit into place in monastic libraries. Um, I'd question the stuff about his, historic, maybe not stories, but narratives, because lots of the historians were, in fact, of course, monks. Manuscripts are often recycled, maybe to support the binding of another manuscript or an early printed book. They point out that not all manuscripts are large, impress impressive objects. It's quite possible that the surviving body of evidence is biased towards large, impressive manuscripts because people look after those, so they are more likely to survive. There are, are English accounts of people wrapping meat or candles in old manuscripts that outlive their usefulness. Some manuscripts were even used as shoe liners. One of the more colourful examples was the use of a recycled medieval manuscript to stiffen a bishop's mitre, as we see in this image here. Uh, unbeknownst to him, <laughs> apparently, it's a potentially an erotic tale translated from French. I kind of love that. They, The group behind this study are hoping that they're going to be able to look at the traditions of Spain, Italy or other places where chivalric romances flourished. And a big challenge challenge that requires further research remains, quote, I do think this research touches on the preservation of culture. Now we have estimates of the size of the loss. What we don't have is a statistical explanation of why books were lost. We don't know what drives cultural loss. We're all thinking very hard now about how we can build a statistical model that also explains why certain things survived and others did not. Next up is... It's, it's cuckoo for cocoa puffs. This next one, I, I don't, I don't know what to make of it. I'm just going to share it. I'm just going to. What is what is this? There is a picture in the article. Um, you can see the cooler in question. I haven't linked it. Cause obviously, you can partially see human remains. A man who was stopped for drinking in a park in Peru was found to be in possession of, of a 600 to 800 year old set of mummified human remains in a cooler bag. The individual was a food delivery man, which makes me really question whether I want to do a delivery um, tomorrow. I have questions about this. Um, apparently he was showing off the remains to two friends in a park on Saturday. Quote, person who had this mummified person in a cooler bag, quote, I take care of her and she takes care of me. Uh, okay. Um, he was working at the time. He was stopped uh, and searched. 
he's named it Juanita and called her his spiritual friend. But the authorities think that actually the individual is probably male and it's now in the possession of Peru's Ministry of Culture. We're not sure apparently how he came to be in possession of the mummified remains. Um, mummification was, of course, a common practice in several cultures in Peru before the conquistadors arrived in the 16th century. In 2021, archaeologists in Peru found mummified remains believed to be up to 1,200 years old in an underground tomb. The individual in question, Bermejo, I think it's pronounced, has been charged with illegal possession of historical patrimony and could face up to five years in jail. I just... Can you imagine if you're sitting down having a drinky drink in a park with your pals and then your buddy, your acquaintance comes up with a cooler and you think, oh, he's brought the beers and then he opens it up and there is a mummified person in there. I, I'd be I'd be questioning, I'd be questioning my friendship. I'm I'm not going to lie. Um that's that's Peru's Doordash, is it? <laughs> If he, if it, d, d, when he has orders that require the cool bag, when he has orders that require the cool bag, where does he put Juanita? Am I? I just, I'm, I'm, I am. It's, it's rare that I'm rendered near speechless. I'm not going to lie, but I read that and went, I'm going to put it in, and I'm sure that when it comes round to it, I will think of something erudite to say but i'll tell you what i've not thought of it yet um it makes me uncomfortable <laughs> um and i next time a delivery driver opens a bag i'm gonna be like sir sir um hold up where do you get the money that's a very good question no one knows no one knows she <laughs> possibly possibly it's very upsetting. It's very upsetting. Um, you messaged me on. I did. I don't recognise that name, so I don't. I don't think I. I, I don't recognise the name, so it hasn't come through to me, or I haven't seen it. Um, I don't know. Just Instagram. I don't know how Instagram messaging sometimes works. Um, always, if you can, if you can, maybe. Tag me. Email's the best. If Instagram is is playing up for you, if I'm not, if you, if I haven't put it in a news piece and I haven't thanked you at the start, um, something might be going awry. My email is readingthepath.cat at gmail.com. So try that. Oh, I missed this joke. It's inappropriate. It's inappropriate. Yes, if if I'm not responding to Insta, I just haven't I it's not working and I don't know how to fix anything. So um, email, please. Thank you very much. What did his friend say? That's not been reported. Um, I, I'm baffled. I'll be, I'll be honest. I'm baffled. Um, and I am upset by the, the fact that that was in a freezer bag. <laughs> I'm upset. I'm upset that that happened. Um, and I think that it's grave robbing shouldn't happen um ever <laughs> so don't like it not for me no thanks this is a cool one mudlarking um i had the very uh great pleasure of of accompanying a mudlark a few years ago it is something that you need to be licensed for don't just go wandering down there because there are rules regulations and, and safety aspects because the Thames is the tidal river don't go mudlarking by yourself don't go mudlarking without someone who knows what they're doing the Thames is the tidal river you can get in yourself into situations where you get cut off you get stuck um and nobody i no one wants to go impromptu impromptu swimming in the Thames just putting that out there however with that being said a mudlarker has discovered a rare Tudor leather archer's wrist guard and it's got a really cool pattern it's been found on the thames river bank and it was found on the 18th of february and it has been confirmed its authenticity has been confirmed by the museum of london 
Uh, similar examples to this have been found on the Mary Rose, which sunk in 1545. And in fact, in this article, there is a picture of a wrist guard from the Mary Rose. It's made of thick leather and it's decorated with punched scallop shell and small cross motifs. So I'm just going to put it back up there. You can see it large and I'll tell you what it's described as. They think that it's from the first half of the 16th century. Mudlarking is searching the banks of the Thames at low tide for interesting historical objects and it was made popular in the Victorian period. Of course, the riverbank has been inhabited since prehistoric times. You can, I mean, I love checking out and trying to see if people have got clay pipes, for example. The river's mud mean that leather and even furs can be well preserved due to the lack of or, um, of oxygen. This The mudlarker in question is a paleontologist by trade and said that it was a rare and exciting find. He took up mudlarking during the lockdown. He started finding clay pipes and everything that they find, which may be of historical significance, has to that might fall under the Treasure Act, you have to flag to the Museum of London. Since then, I've got a better idea of identifying whether something's valuable or not. So things that have been found, a Roman cup, a 5,000-year-old uh, human leg bone, a 15th century skeleton wearing thigh-high boots. I will be looking that article up later. And a fragment of Neolithic human skull. It's, as I pointed out, you can get your permits from the Port of London authorities. People used to dig into the mud. You're now not allowed to dig. You can't take a spade or something. It has to be on the surface. The most you can do is rinse. It's what you find. This risk guard is now undergoing further analysis at the Museum of London, and it's going to be recorded as part of the Portable Antiquity Scheme. The mudlarker, Mr Ciccone, said he recognised the old and symbolic shapes and was immediately excited because the flowers indicated that it could be Tudor. He took it home and put it in his fridge because of it being leather. I don't think he was like, mm, tea for later. Um, he said it's quite exceptional, it's almost complete, and so now it has to be professionally dried with machines. It's very fancy, thigh-high boots, but uh, it's that is in the medieval period. There are quite a lot of short jackets and very tall boots. So, yes, it is almost it's always amazing what they are still finding after all this time. And part of that is because the Thames is a tidal river and things are moving about, etc. Um, John, fear not, the Thames is much cleaner than it used to be. In fact, we last summer there was a little lido that opened in part of the Thames and I took my son swimming in it. Before his second birthday, he swam in the Thames. And I'll tell you what, when I was growing up, you would never have caught me saying that or thinking about doing that. But now parts of it are safe enough to canoe and swim in. So it's much, much cleaner than it was. And hopefully it stays that way. Uh, apparently, YouTubers are mudlocking on the Thames. I hope that they are doing it safely and appropriately and are following all the rules when doing so. I say that because I've seen people on social media digging stuff up when they certainly shouldn't be. I'm just having a little... Uh, sci finds and Nicola White channels, both Thames mudlarks. Fabulous. There are some great mudlarks on Instagram as well, who I know are also appropriately licensed because I went down to the to do to watch them do some mudlarking. So I know. And yes, indeed, yay for a clean Thames. Absolutely. I still wouldn't recommend swimming in it unless it's in a, a certified Lido. I would still avoid going paddling just in case. This is a 19th century story here. There has been some studies done that point to the idea that perhaps it was air pollution that gave the work of certain 19th century painters their particular aesthetic. 19th century landscape paintings ha hanging in London's Tate Modern look awfully familiar, apparently, to the climate physicist Anna Leah Al Albright. Joseph Mallard William Turner's signature way of shrouding his vistas in fog and smoke reminded Albright of her own research tracking air pollution. Perhaps Albright thought this burgeoning painting style wasn't a purely artistic phenomenon, and instead it was people painting what they saw, their environs becoming more and more obscured by smokestack haze. So Albright teamed up with Harvard University climatologist Peter Hybers 
or Huber, sorry, who is an expert in reconstructing pollution before instruments existed to closely track air quality. And they analyse 130 paintings by Turner and by the Paris-based Impressionist Claude Monet, also several others, to tell a tale of two modernising cities. And what they've done is here, this is incredible comparison here. So the early works of Turner, which we see on the left-hand side, that's me figuring out which one's my left hand, on the left-hand side of the image, you can see incredibly clear, sharp details. But with his later works, such as Rain, Steam and Speed, the Great Western Railway, which is painted in 1844, so 30 years later, there's this kind of dreamier aesthetic, there's less contrast. Is that because that's what he's seeing? They believe that 61 percent of contrast differences between the paintings could be down to air pollution. In that respect, quote, different painters will paint in a similar way when the environment is similar. But she says, I don't want to overstep and say, oh, we can explain all of Impressionism. But isn't that fascinating that it's um, not necessarily, it could be about an aesthetic style and a fashion but it could actually be that style could have been generated because people are painting realistically what they're seeing. We've got an 1821 shipwreck. We're staying with the 19th century. The SS Savannah could have washed up um, as flotsam on a New York beach. This um, ran aground in 1821. The piece measured about 13 by 13 feet wide and it's up currently being held by the Fire Island Lighthouse Preservation Society, which is working with the National Park Service to determine the origins of the wreckage. Understandably, it's being referred to as a pretty thrilling find. They're definitely going to have some subject matter experts take a look at it and get a better idea of what they've got. According to the National Park Service, the SS Savannah has emerged as the likeliest contender, as it remains one of Fire Island's best-known shipwrecks. Further evidence, too, lies in the 1.3-inch trinails, trinails, or wooden pegs that hold the wreckage's planks together, fitting for a vessel that measured originally some 100 feet. Additionally, in the iron spikes that's present on the artefact, which were used in shipbuilding around 1820. This ship, SS Savannah, was constructed in 1818, and its partial steam-powered capabilities, so it heralded that that the date it set out for its transatlantic voyage, May 22nd, 1819, is still commemorated as National Maritime Day. The research is going to continue. The National Park Service has similarly emphasised that a study of the wreckage could provide historical as much as environmental clues. Quote, interpretation of the wreckage may potentially explore such topics as seafaring and navigation. The role of the United States Life Saving Service in the rescue and salvage of wrecked ships, goods, crews and passengers, and the environmental changes that cause such wrecks to be buried and later exposed. Are uh, people coming in saying that they're late? Hello, Elizabeth. Um, well, welcome. And of course, you can always watch this back on the playback. I, I apologise that um, I know that the times that I do these lives at, they're not going to work for everybody. I, I understand that. I'm very privileged to have a global audience. Uh, currently, we're, I'm doing it at, at half past eight because that kind of works with the time my son goes to bed when I've got some free time in the evening. But as time moves on, if there's a, a general swelling of people asking me to do it potentially at different times, uh, and maybe as I get more embedded into it, I can test out doing it on different days and different times. In fact, next week, I should flag this up now, next week I may not be here on Monday night because I have some family obligations that may require being taken care of. So I will be thinking about doing it on Tuesday. I may have to do it on the same time, at the same time on a Tuesday night. Alternatively, I might see if I can figure out a way to do it perhaps earlier in my day because uh, my son will be at daycare. So I'm going to have a think about that and maybe it'll be a good opportunity to test stuff out, particularly as I can't do the regular time. Sorry, just... It 
is there a way to release a survey of time zones? I could figure that the way I've been doing it, the way I've been figuring out what time zone people are most likely to be in is I've been looking at what my largest audience is in my YouTube analytics. Um, let me see what I can, th what I can do. And cause I'd, obviously I'd need a survey would have to kind of have the option to add things to it. I'm guessing. Let me think about that and see how I can figure out what to do. Thank you though. Right. Another piece of new news still with the 19th century. A collection of books by Matthew Flinders that were used by Matthew Flinders during his 1801 circumnavigation have been donated to the National Archives of Australia. This is the circumnavigation and eventual mapping of the Australian continent. The workings of the master cartographer had not been seen by the world since Flinders left Australia in 1803. Now, two centuries later, the books he uses as source um, are back on Australian soil and in the possession of the National Archives in Canberra. Quote, they are unique. These books are internationally significant. And we see in the key points that these are books used by Matthew Flinders. They've returned after two centuries. But the collection includes handwritten corrections to Cook's maps and a short dictionary of the indigenous language. Philanthropist Barbara Mason bought the historical items and donated them to the National Archives of Australia. And here we have a picture um, showing some of this uh, language. It's words of the Indigenous population written, it, written by Flinders alongside uh, Cook's previous recording. So that's also really interesting. Flinders set sail from England in 1801 aboard the HMS Investigator, charged with creating the first full map of the Australian continent. Flinders is also thought to be the first person to use the name Australia as opposed to Terra Australis. Uh, Mr Fox said this is a really important story in the colonial history of Australia, but he said that the book also contains early written records of Indigenous language used in southern Western Australia. Flinders recorded a short dictionary of the Indigenous language created while on the traditional country of the Minang Miong Nungor people. Mr Fox said the National Archives will now consult with First Nations people from the region to establish the significance of the language record. So as in, did he get it right or not? We are about to move on to events and exhibitions. So I am just going to. <laughs> uh, yes. You are not wrong, actually. Now you mention it. They, those, those eyes burrow into your soul, do they not? Um, daylight savings time is coming to the US. So it could all be. It's gonna, daylight savings time is also coming to the UK. So it's all going to hop, ski, scop, seize around. My favourite castle in Europe is the Tower of London. In fact, it's one of my favourite places in Europe. I maybe, you know, maybe I should think further afield for me, but um, I just, I love the Tower. I'm always, I love every time I get to go there. I love every time I get to work there. Um, there's still so much history that is being found there. I love the stories. Absolutely love it. He looks a little like a young Hugh Jackman. And now you said that, I cannot unsee that either. <laughs> Cannot unsee it. Lovely. Right. We're going to hop into events and exhibitions. This first up, the Young VA, which used to be the Museum of Childhood. It uh, is reopening. It's set to reopen on the 1st of July 2023. And they are have updated things. The tagline is supposed to be instead of you know please don't touch the tagline is supposed to be please do touch so it's all about toys and all sorts of things that kids will enjoy and they're gonna have loads of really cool activities and stuff the young vna is in bethnal green so do check that out when it opens if you are in the uk or if you're having plans to come to the uk as is the accessibility information isn't available on the website yet uh 
but it the VNA the rest of the VNA sites that are currently open do have their accessibility recognised and placed within their website. So I think it's just a case that because it hasn't opened yet, it's not available. So it's worth checking out as we approach the opening time. If you need the accessibility information, it should be on the website. With when I have found the information on accessibility and how to gain access, if you require it, I have linked that both in the Opera Pinboard and also in the description box. However, not all of these do have I been able to find the access information. And that, that is the case with this next one. The Archaeological Museum of El Elificina has reopened to the public. The website I found quite hard to navigate. So I'm basing this on a news art article. I'm, I'm showing you the news article because I couldn't really navigate the website very well. I was trying to read it in Google Translation, so that may be a massive factor as to why I couldn't find their accessibility information or what was going on there. Um, this museum was built in the late 19th century, and it's, as the city has been declared a 2023 culture capital of Europe, this is all, lots of things have been um, refitted. The permanent exhibition at the Archaeological Museum of El Ficina both illustrates and recounts the founding myth of mystic worship and initiation ceremonies, juxtaposing original objects with the comments of ancient writers. It also finds it also features finds relating to the beginning of worship, besides the architectural and monumental fragments and offerings to the goddesses. So if you have plans to be around the Archaeological Museum of El Ficina, um, do let me know what it's like. Uh, what what the story of the Eleusian mysteries it's telling, and if you can find out at all what the accessibility information is and potentially send me a link, I would be much appreciated because I could always go back in and edit both the opera pin board and the description box if the accessibility is um, available. Apparently, the VNA have an ASMR series on their YouTube channel. So, if you like restoration ASMR, it's a must view. Well, I know what I'm going to be finding to help put me to sleep tonight. Thank you, Homebody. Lovely. Hello, Yvonne. Welcome from Pennsylvania. Thank you very much. And Indiana as well. Hello. I don't think I've got any Indiana or Pennsylvania uh, exhibitions, do I? don't think so. We have got some cool exhibitions at the Booth Museum. Um, so this is so, these are, one is a photographic exhibition and one is, is uh, an exhibition of art from 1839 to 1848. These upcoming exhibitions, we have a photographer exhibition Barbara Van Cleve's Women of the West which opens April 15th and runs to October 15th 2023 this is a collection of 78 black and white photographs from 1986 to 2014 and it's about traveling around the ranches in the west of America and then the other one opens on July 1st and closes on December 31st, 2023. We set our eyes westward. One woman's journey, 1839 to 1848. So this is um, an artist, Heidi Press, who studied the journals written by Keturah Penton Belknap between 1839 and 1848. And this is an exhibition that is based upon that. This exhibition, the next one, has travelled. We've talked about this in, this is now on its third location, um, and the Donatellos have, the exhibitions have been slightly different, but it's broadly speaking a similar vein of exhibition, but it started off in Italy, and some of the stuff couldn't leave. So there is less items than was in the original exhibition. I don't know if they've been replaced and made up with other stuff. But this is at the V&A in uh, South Ken, Donatello sculpting the Renaissance. And this is closing very soon, the 11th of June, 2023. Ticket prices are £20. So if you are interested in Donatello and you are going to be in London or you're in London currently, then 
that is worth checking out. Oh, hang on one second. I meant to mention this. The Tudor's Art of Majesty in Renaissance England is in Ohio. It opened on, that's February 26th. You do your dates differently to how we do. February 26th, 2023. And it's running until May May 14th, 2023. I've heard nothing but good things about this exhibition. I did buy the Metropolitan Museum's book. Uh, so I'm assuming that a similar book will be available for this. So check that out. I meant to flag that because it is going on. And um, if you missed it at the Met, check it out. I'm so envious <laughs> the people that get to go and see this one. This is a uh, Women's History Month event uh, run by the Thames Discovery Programme and it connects back to mudlarking. This is uh, being run by a mudlark and it's all kind of found objects and things like that. So if you're interested by women's history, by mudlarking, by found events, those sorts of storytellings, and I believe also creative stuff. And you are in London on the 25th of March, 2023, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. GMT, then this, these are selling tickets and it looks like it could be really interesting. So do check that out. We are moving on to our final event. And this is the one that my lovely friend Philippa is running. And she very kindly invited me to take part. This is this month. It's soon. Very, very soon. Friday 24th of March. It opens at 8pm and it is running until Sunday the 26th of March. So this very month. I can't count the days. It's less than 20. <laughs> 18 days. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I'm allowed to parent a child. <laughs> 18 days it starts in how many just over two weeks wow cool good work cat well done um and it's being hosted by the fabulous philippa who runs british history events and british history tours this is called the georgians online history festival and you will see here the speaker lineup and i am biased because i'm in it is phenomenal we have the illustrious Tracy Borman talking about Henrietta Howard, the phenomenal Gareth Russell talking about abolitionists, aristocrats and adventurers. We've got spectacular Ilary Lynn, who is a fabulous costume historian talking about dressing the Georgians. Me talking about bare knuckle boxers. We've got wonderful Antonia Keeney talking about saints, sinners and scoundrels, Blenheim Palace and the fabulous Anne Stott talking about Princess Charlotte who she is referring to as the first people's princess. So I think this is, um, I'm really proud to be part of this. Uh, Philippa put on an incredible Stuart's event. And if you your tickets include all the historian talks, there's a prize draw. The prize draw, you could get your ticket refunded. And there's also a prize of an Amazon gift voucher as well. There's going to be a live discussion panel and also a quiz on the Sunday night. So there's all sorts of fabulous things to be checking out. And of course, the more this stuff does well, the more these events, and it's great they're online events because so many of you are from all over the world. It gets everybody chatting much like this. If this works, as the Stuart seminar did, and and I know it will because it's, a fa it's going to be a fabulous event, then it's just going to encourage the lovely Philippa, a British British history do check out her channel both here on youtube and also her instagram and make sure you're all checking us all out on history after dark on wednesday if you come and buy tickets it tells philippa that you want her to do more and so she will make more essentially if you like it then buy a ticket it tells her to do it again <laughs> and then i get to do more talks which is always fun um so that is what i have for you um and Philippa, you are correct. The Georgians were both naughty and fascinating. And considering the way that this life has gone, <laughs> I feel like all of you <laughs> could um, have a good old time because there has been some eyebrow raising smut in the comments, which I have enjoyed. I'm not going to lie. It's but it's it's definitely leading me astray. Uh, Intrepid Freddy Cat, it's online so everyone can go. Absolutely. That's that's what we love to we love to do it. Uh, no one spends your money better than me. I mean, 
I am good at that. Just ask my husband. <laughs> uh, thumbs up all round from John. Thank you. Uh, oh, excellent. You can make them perfect. And also, if if you cannot make the times of these events, then they will also be available for you to watch on the playback with your link. Naughty history fans. We are indeed naughty history fans. And we do all we are all the Georgians today. We're all full of gout and smut. <laughs> naughty can be fun. And homebody, thank you very much. Yes, please do. We are wrapping up. Please make sure you've liked this video. Please make sure you are subscribed to the channel and that you hit the bell icon and select it all so that YouTube will allegedly update you when I am putting up a premiere for a pre recorded video or indeed going live again let's think about a social glyph my husband pointed out that he had to go in and manually accept when i told people to put aubergines slash what do you call them eggplants um so we're not gonna do that because apparently youtube knows that that means penis <laughs> so let's think of another history related emoji i'll tell you what put your favorite or most used emoji in the comments whether it's history or not what is the one that you is the one that you have used the most most recently i want to see how your minds work um uh, and in the meantime thank you all so much for spending this time with me thank you to everybody who sends me news items thank you for enjoying the comments and thank you for chatting with me and making me laugh um i have such a load of fun on a monday night we will have a video a pre-recorded video up on friday as I said, next week, we aren't going to be going live on Monday. It will be on Tuesday. I'm not quite sure of what the time is going to be. So I will be scheduling it to link after my Friday video. Hopefully I should know by then. Um, if I don't know by then, then I'll put out a community tab post to let you all know what's going on. I'm seeing some fabulous emojis that I've never seen before. Excellent. Excellent. I will be checking these out. Fabulous. Chili spices, seeing some some peaches. Naughty, naughty. Right. Thank you all, friends. And I hope you have a great Monday, however much of your Monday is left. And regardless, that the rest of your week is absolutely fabulous and uh, that you manage to stay warm if it's cold where you are and cool if it's hot where you are. And until the next time we meet, and I will look forward to speaking to you all in my next video, but do take care of yourselves. and. Bye-bye for now.